these earthen structures date from 800 BC in Burkina Faso. They're some of the most early earthen structures ever discovered. But as you can see, they are way too small to sleep in. Unless a man would stand inside, it would really have no meaning. But that's not what they were used for. They're actually made for smelting metals of different kind. This is the earliest evidence we have, direct evidence, of smelting of metals in this region. And remember, they also smelted iron, which was very rare in the world, even for this time. These type of structures are not just unique to smelters. Burkina Faso has some of the oldest buildings of clay and of brick. West Africa hails, in comparison to other places, as one of those areas that have done great achievements for Africa. If it weren't for West Africa, we probably would all still be debating whether or not black people were capable of such structures. But since West Africa is so out of the way, a lot of people around the world have given up on these concepts, instead trying to downplay the history. But the history is there for you to see. Copper, iron, tin, gold, these are just some of the metals that would have been made in this region. It's interesting too that after they make these, they start to become extremely rich. And their wealth translates into the modern age. There are a lot of people that we could talk about, but let's talk about one modern architect for a second before we go back to Burkina Faso. One who created multiple structures mimicking African structures. Pierre Luigi Nervi was a engineer from Italy and he built several structures that became world famous. For example, this dome shape which was used in the Olympics where Muhammad Ali won and became famous. This guy who built this structure before he built this spent some time in South Africa and lots of architects have pointed out the similarities between this dome and Zulu huts. But this is only one of the things that links him to Africa. He actually went to Africa several times and in fact started projects, several projects, and built unique modern structures that played on the architecture of the natives in order to give a completely unique style, modern and brilliant. We have mapped, uh, thanks to our research, almost 40 projects in, our, in, in, in this study. And so despite many projects weren't built, and even if uh, uh, actually, some of them uh, were limited to preliminary contexts. Such a list has a great potential in showing us uh, the multifaceted relationship between Studio Nervi and Africa. Uh, so you can see here a project in uh, in Tanzania, in Kenya, Ethiopia context with Ethiopia or uh, the Central African Republic uh, project in Nigeria, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, and and so on. So uh, uh, the whole continent is some somehow touched by uh, by nervous uh, uh, activity or fame. And in, in the next slide, we can take a closer look to uh, Nervi's work, uh, in which we can find a great variety in terms of architectural typologies, in terms as cli of client and, uh, of course, also scale. For instance, here you can see the project for the Tripoli Cultural Center. Um,
Uh, in the next slide, uh, you see um, a very small project, a tiny project, almost entirely self-built. And this is uh, the monastery of the Benedictine sisters in uh, Mafinga, a remote location in, in Tanzania. Uh, so quite a, a, a strange project, not, uh, well, we are not used to, 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 to look at this kind of project when, when thinking about uh, Pierluigi Nervi's work. So how did this work come to Studio Nervi? Well, it came as a result of uh, the fame of the Nervi Hall in the Vatican City. So uh, sisters asked Nervi to provide a very small but important project for them uh, in Tanzania. And Nervi donated, donated this project. And then uh, they adapted it to the poor means and technology that they had over there. Uh, next slide, uh, it's quite the opposite because this is a mega structure uh, imagined for Lagos in Nigeria for a railway terminal and it was uh, unbuilt. Uh, but here the huge scale of technology tells us of the transformation of African cities after 1960s. Um, well, in, in the next slide, uh, we start with a specific paragraph about Ivory Coast, because it is quite surprising to note that in terms of the total number of commissions and projects, after Italy and the United States, Ivory Coast was the third most prolific country for Studio Nervi. There were in, uh, in Italy about uh, 230 projects, uh, 38, almost 40 in the United States, and at least 16 projects in this African country, some of which included clusters of several buildings, many of which were built. Um, this is the, most, uh, the, fir the first and most important building completed by Studio Nervi in Ivory Coast. Uh, and it is the, the headquarters of the African Development Bank uh, in Abidjan, in the downtown of uh, Abidjan, the plateau. Uh, the African Development Bank represented a very important client uh, at the time, uh, given its central role in the economy and politics of the country. And so, well, our, our first question was, how did Nervi come into contact with this part of Africa? And we discovered uh, interesting and also somehow hidden plots mixing the international fame of Nervi as an architect and the political situation of Ivory Coast and also of Togo. Uh, in fact, the, the and so owing, uh, owing the friendly relations between uh, Silvanus Olimpio and uh, Ufue Buani, the, pres the president of uh, Ivory Coast, following the mother of uh, his father, Elpidio, the young architect, the young student, found refuge in uh, Ivory Coast, and he even married Marie Ufue Buani, the daughter of the Ivorian president. And OK, so this is the link, because uh, uh, at Princeton and the United States, it's in the United States in general, Nervi was a figure of great standing. And so we can thus trace Olympia's decision to visit Studio Nervi in Rome at the end of the 60s, uh, and then offering him, thanks to his links with the upper echelons of the Ivorian government, a special and sought after Nervi style while trying to adapt it to a tropical context. So uh, if you look at this wonderful structure, this wonderful roof supported by two sculptural concrete columns and featuring a geometric pattern who ne uh, which Nervi invented in Italy to save money in the 1940s, you would find a sort of blend between the so-called Nervi system or Nervi style and something which could remind you a stereotyped version of some African geometrical patterns. So, uh, as you can see in, in, in this slide, uh, again, this it was a process of translation or tropicalization, which is e uh, even more evident looking at another building. On the, on the left-hand side, you see one of Nervi's Italian masterpieces, the Palazzo del Lavoro in Turin, built in 1961 featuring these giant concrete umbrellas. And well, you would find the same element in the villa design on the right hand side of the screen, uh, designed for the president of the African Development Bank uh, in Abidjan. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, a sort of, as we can see in the next slide, is, is a sort of, uh, well, halfway between a flying saucer or a postmodern tolos uh, with the back half closed and covered with veg vegetation and the front opening onto a south facing garden. In this project, the Italian umbrella becomes a protection against the tropical sun creating again a complex twine between the nervous style and the idea of adaptation to a specific place and climate. Um, so this is another interesting project. We are here in uh, Yamusuko, which uh, was uh, the, new, the new capital of uh, Ivory, Ivory Coast. And something similar happens here. Um, Nervi built several buildings in, uh, in, uh, in Yamusukro, uh, and among them, the most important is the private chapel for the president, Hufu Ebuani. And the chapel was formed by joining four sections based on parabolic and hyperbolic geometry and composed of the by now typical triangular structural mesh used by Nervi over and over again all over the world. This time, again, we could find analogies between, uh, well, let's say, an Ivorian hut and the shape of uh, this roof. But in this case, as you can see in the next picture uh, quite clearly, uh, okay, this is a picture showing you the, the construction process with this triangular uh, truss of prefab elements. And this is the interior of the cathedral um, where you see two pictures uh, First one on the left hand side is uh, St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco and on the right hand side of the screen uh, the uh, small chapel in uh, Yamusukro. So again uh, a sort of recycling of, uh, of uh, uh, a previous project but with also an adaptation, uh, let's say tropicalization in this case in Ivory Coast. Pierre Luigi Nervi's usage of African styles and then bringing them to foreign places like America and Italy is well noted and this is why we can see that his personal style was highly influenced by African architecture even the type of architecture that people outside of Nervi and enlightened Europeans and Africans would have looked at as primitive drawing mass mass understanding and humble interpretation to create such fascinating buildings but these buildings represent modern architecture of one type there are several other modernists who praised Africa for their simplicity of form which became the mantra for the modernists because obviously gothic architecture which they loved was way too complicated in its assemblage but if when they came to africa they realized something that the people in africa were more for form for function over form rather than form over function and their function over form is noted from the ancient Egyptians who surprisingly the ancient Egyptians had pretty simple structures for who they were you look all the way down to Ethiopia and no matter how complex the building is it stays simple you go all the way down to Great Zimbabwe go to Congo and then let's return back to Burkina Faso and the Ivory Coast these are the ruins of Lorobeni, and they date from a thousand years ago, and they represent the stone structures that have been built in Africa, even though they were mud brick structures and they were also grass structures. Something that people overlook is how the climate of Africa wasn't exactly built to make giant rocks, and only with very modern technology with good ventilation and stuff like that did it start to make sense in Africa in some cases but you have Asante buildings you have the Malayan buildings you have all these buildings in West Africa in East Africa in Southern Africa in Central Africa North Africa Egypt and these inspire 
modern architects to go away from sort of European structures and they looked elsewhere and you'd notice how they didn't land on Japanese or Chinese or Indian or Native American structures but instead their buildings look closer to African structures because they adopted the form from function or function above form something that the Africans had adopted really thousands of years ago. I mean, if you look at that building from Egypt, you, it almost looks modern. Every time I show it to someone, some people, they actually think it's a building that was made like maybe in the 1960s or something. That was made thousands of years ago. As you can see here, the Bauhaus movement by Walter Gropius, who is the founder of the Bauhaus movement, supposedly, uh, he made a manifesto in April 1919 in Germany. The subject matter of new objectivity was highly active and provocative and confrontational, but the styles employed by the artist were deliberately from Old World, especially from Africa. The reason was during the 1900s, the avant-garde artists their dealers and leading critics of the era were among the first Europeans to collect African sculptures and masks for the aesthetic value on their way to modernism. An artist that makes this almost too obvious is Pablo Picasso with his African period that lasted from 1906 to 1909 and you can see that the influence is too strong to be ignored but not only that we start to see many people start to have this opinion that art didn't have to be this renaissance style but instead could be anything even geometric shapes and what area of the world used geometric shapes in very intricate ways this obsession in Africa to use geometric shapes would soon influence Europe to create cubism and as you can see cubism is sort of a mix between geometric shapes and African masks creating this sort of slurry of push and back of form this new wave that was pushed by Africa looked completely unique to the European eye but this is because they had not seen African art in this way before there are some Europeans who even deliberately called their artworks Africa Wassily Kandinsky is one of the earliest abstract painters who transitioned from old world painting or European painting to impressionism to all of these that would come after someone else who did this and you can see he's transition in understanding is Salvador Dali who starts off as a regular painter and ends up in these areas and you can see the influence of Africa on his art I mean it's everywhere but not only that it's a little more pronounced with him and of course there's Pablo Picasso which I showed earlier who sh showed the face masks it had become obvious at this point that Africa was gonna play major roles in the views of these Europeans in cubism and all this other stuff but if you look at Africa and you look at Europe with these two art styles you can see that for Europe it resembled a breaking down of something you can see that it's being used as a tear away from something as like we're going away from something we're gonna go crazy but in Africa this is not the case in Africa these random shapes or geometric shapes that are random they resemble order they don't resemble scrambleness or a fall away from the old or unsightliness or whatever they resemble purity of form
in the way that Renaissance art resembled it for the Europeans. And the geometric shapes are as difficult to make as Renaissance art. Something I like about the African patterns is their commitment to geometric patterns and commitment to things like symmetry and waveform and all these other things is so precise that you can tell that it's not a natural thing it's not a natural structure and it's so alien that if you saw it in a movie it would be like a really cool thing like if you saw it in an alien movie like they suddenly get to a door or they get to a piece of land and this is what it looks like this would shock everybody this would be something that would take you into the movie and make you realize god damn because the thought behind this is too deep and this is just one picture i've got lots of them from different parts of africa and they tend to have this thing of digital patterns you know, if you look at Zulu beads, they have this thing of digital patterns. They look like they were made by a computer. And this is because of the commitment to the geometry. This is what makes it as difficult as any other place in the world to create. So as you can see, African art or African architecture was not separate from modern architecture. In fact, it was the reason why modern architecture became what it is today functional rather than the old world of trying to make it too complicated and the geometric patterns and abstract art that would eventually lead to other ideas like the Bauhaus movement are very easy to see their Africanness about them and even the writers had something to say so and the funny here's the funniest part modern art is not from the 1900s and people act like buildings from the 1900s in africa are you know rubbish while the ones in europe are great but look at africa and look at europe built there's buildings everywhere in africa and there's buildings everywhere in europe and the buildings in africa start way back I mean, even before the 1900s.